Welcome everyone. I will give people just a moment to join and then we will get started. All right, we will go ahead and get started. So welcome, this evening we're gonna be talking about the Child Clinical Psychology Postdoctoral Training Program at University of Michigan in the Department of Psychiatry. Here is our agenda for the evening. So we'll go over the program, both the uh, network as well as the child program specifically. We'll talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion and different initiatives, both here in the department as well as at the university as a whole. Uh, we'll talk about the clinical opportunities and the research opportunities that uh, fellows have um, access to here in our department. We'll talk about local attractions here in Ann Arbor, look at some alumni profiles, past fellows and what they're doing now. And then I'll end with um, some information about the application process. And if there's uh, time and people are interested, we'll do some Q&A at the very end. So let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, so also most of the pictures that you'll see in tonight's presentation are taken um, in the Rachel Upjohn building, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, my background, this is not my home office. This is the Rachel Upjohn building as well, the atrium. So Michigan Medicine, sometimes referred to as MishMed in writing, and collaborated with the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System, VAAAHS, and they've collaborated to create a network of psychology postdoctoral training programs. Each of these programs uh, in the network are APA accredited, and together they provide a really interdis interdisciplinary training environment with seminars, invited lectures, opportunities for collaboration with faculty across the network. Um, and it really just helps provide a very collegial and um, rich research and clinical experience for postdoctoral fellows. Today, we'll be talking mostly about the child fellowship because presumably that's what you are interested in. If you're more interested in our adult fellowship, our VA fellowships, our um, neurology, neuropsych fellowships, please look at our website because you can find more information about these other programs that are associated with the network. Across that network, the training philosophy, uh, philosophy is a scientist practitioner model. Basically, that just means that our central goal and mission is to contribute to the development of competent clinical psychologists who do great research in science. We will, as a network, select candidates whose academic and clinical preparation, whose supervisor recommendations, and just the synergy between all these different things are, see, are seen to be as ideally suited to our programs and our needs. Um, some inf information about benefits. We have healthcare coverage. There's pretty ample vacation and sick and professional development time. Um, there's some travel support and professional development support as well. So talking specifically about the clinical child program, this is a view of the Rachel Upjohn building from the back. So our program is um, the very first clinical child psychology postdoctoral training program in the nation to be accredited as a specialty program by APA. And here in, um, in Ann Arbor, we provide advanced specialized training in psychology across two years of fellowship. So it's typically a two-year program. And we try to help people who are interested seek careers in academic institutions or positions of leadership in clinical or educational settings. Our programming, our offerings, our educational offerings are very balanced and it's kind of unique. We offer approximately 50% of fellow time to be focused on research and educational opportunities combined. So that's 50%. And then the other 50% is clinical responsibilities. During our fellowship, we have opportunities for regular scheduled educational didactics. So there's required educational activities that include things like weekly PD seminars, uh, weekly child seminar, monthly postdoctoral forum, and bioethics conference. But we also have a number of optional activities that most fellows take advantage of some or all of. So there's weekly grand rounds where we bring in um, national, international experts on a variety of topics that are relevant to psychology, psychiatry, social work, uh, and that is something that you would have access to as a postdoctoral fellow here. Similarly, we have other things um, that provide really uh, first-class education, things like monthly global case conference. We have 
number of multidisciplinary sections or teams that you will likely be a part of, and you'll have an opportunity to sit in on some of those team meetings. Um, there's research development seminars. There are uh, grants and progress seminars and trainings that you can go to. Of course, invited lectures throughout the university. Um, there's one certificate program that I've heard a number of our fellows take advantage of and find to be extremely valuable, which is the Rackham Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Certificate. Um, and then as a postdoc, typically in your second year, you'll have the opportunity to provide clinical supervision to a practicum student, a psychology practicum student. And then certainly through research, you may have the opportunity to supervise or provide mentorship to undergrads or um, more junior psychology uh, candidates and fellows. So as I have alluded to, our space is uh, almost entirely located um, in something called the Rachel Upjohn Building. And that is a building on the East Ann Arbor campus, medical campus in Ann Arbor. Um, and like I said, many of the pictures you'll be seeing today as our background are located or are pictures of the Rachel Upjohn Building. So diversity, equity, inclusion, um, here in the Department of Psychiatry, as well as at University of Michigan as a whole, we have a strong commitment to what we call DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Here at the department level, just in psychiatry, we have a mission, um, which you could read the details up here, but I'll just summarize for you. So we have a mission to integrate principles of DEI into our culture, our policies, to promote health and well-being of staff, trainees, patients, research participants, and the community. We are commu committed to facilitating diverse thinking, representation, opportunities, and that sense of belonging into decreased bias and stigma. We commit to evolve and grow in our understanding of the strengths that come from differences and similarities and treat all people with dignity and respect. So to work toward this mission at the department and university, we offer many opportunities to facilitate ongoing learning and growth. Let's talk just briefly about some of the opportunities that are here, both within the department and the university as a whole. So the Department of Psychiatry has what we call the DEI Lunch and Learn series. And every month there's a different topic on something related to diversity, equity, or inclusion. I pulled up some of the uh, talks from the most recent months. So in August, there was a talk entitled Neurodiversity and the Changing State of the Autism Field. In September, there was a talk entitled How to Live an Anti-Racist Life at Work and at Home. And then October's topic was Trans People, Healthcare Access, and the Role of the Clinician. Um, so really, you can see that we interpret the um, idea of DEI quite broadly across mental health um, and across workplace um, growth and you know, um, collegiality, things like that. We also have a DEI book club um, that meets approximately once a month. And this word book club is also interpreted very broadly. So it's not just related uh, or specific to books. It includes things like movies or podcasts or any kind of media that can be consumed that might aid in learning in this area. So a couple of examples of recent um, book, book club topics have included um, a book by Emmanuel Acco entitled Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, the movie Moonlight, um, I believe another book called If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin, and the movie Coda. That was just a few days ago was the book club on Coda. And then, of course, um, as I mentioned already, we have weekly brand rounds here in the Department of Psychiatry. And regularly, those take a quite um, vocal uh, spotlight on DEI issues. So in the past year, two that come to recent memory include one entitled Continuing the Conversation on Anti-Racism and Strengthening Connections, Reconnect and Reflect, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Wellness. So those were two um, uh, grand rounds topics where we really was explicitly focused on DEI issues. Many of our other um, topics or, or speakers that come in will touch on issues related to DEI as well, of course. Outside of our department, there are other opportunities. I think I already mentioned that the um, Rackham, which is our graduate school, uh, offers a DEI certificate program. There's also an annual DEI summit at the university level. And this year, the topic was DEI nurturing the heart, mind, and soul. So also still quite relevant for psychiatry. 
And then there are DEI communities both within and outside of our department. Now, again, these are some of the formal opportunities, but we strive to, as a department and also as a program, as a psychology program, we strive to incorporate DEI perspectives formally and informally into our clinical training and research offerings. So one example of that is there are some clinicians on our child team who have been working to train um, themselves and now others on the cultural formulation interview. And we're planning to pilot an associated rotation with the cultural formulation interview in the child section this coming win winter. So on that note, we'll move into talking about some of the clinical offerings that are available in our program. Child fellows, look, this is the same, a different view of um, our beautiful atrium here in the Rachel Upjohn building. So child fellows at the beginning of their training will create an individualized training program or um, an IDP as we call it. And like I mentioned before, clinical experiences typically account for about 50% of any fellows experience. All fellows will carry a caseload of outpatient clients. Um, and again, that will take place at the Rachel Upjohn building. And you can pick those up from the psychotherapy wait list or from intake appointments. Usually fellows do some mixture of those two things. In addition, we have a number of rotations, which are both required. Some are required, some are optional. Um, some are sort of like on top of that uh, optional as well. So one required rotation that every fellow will do usually in their second year is a full year um, assessment clinic. So you, as a second year postdoc fellow, you'll rotate through one of our um, psychoeducational clinics. Usually that's through neuropsych. We have um, supervisors at neuropsych, but we also have some uh, child psychology faculty who are able to supervise those. And you'll do about one per month. Occasionally there's also opportunities to rotate through a child autism assessment clinic, either in addition or instead of part of that um, assessment rotation. Aside from that, um, in your first and second year, you will choose from some of our many clinics to supplement both your outpatient cases and your assessment cases. So one of the um, most popular and, and really most amazing clinics that we have is the Infant and Early Childhood Clinic. So if you have an early childhood interest, this is a great opportunity to pick up early childhood treatment cases. Usually, I think the age range here is like two to five or six, maybe even younger. Um, and you can, as a fellow, you can see patients in this um, setting. You can also support the evaluation. So our what we call IECC offers a very dynamic observational and dyadic um, evaluation. And so you can be a part of that. And you can also uh, build leadership skills and provide some supervision to our inter interdisciplinary team of trainees. So psychiatry, social work, and psychology trainees all rotate through this clinic. And it's a good opportunity to learn about diagnostic and classification system, um, child parent psychotherapy, the circle of security, mom power, PCIT, other childhood, early childhood based interventions um, are offered in this clinic. Next, we have one of our other very common and, and wonderful um, outpatient clinics called TAG or Trauma and Grief. And TAG runs on Fridays throughout the year. Intake and assessment sessions happen in the morning and didactics happen in the middle of the day and then therapy clients are seen in the afternoons. At some point, most postdoctoral fellows uh, do complete a rotation through TAG. And those fellows who are really specializing in trauma work, those they tend to do a full day um, rotation. And then um, others may just do either the assessment or the uh, therapy intervention um, clinics. And the, this clinic runs from January to June and then again from July to December, so in two six month rotations. Similarly, we have what we call PMT clinic, peer management therapy, and CBT clinic, cognitive behavioral therapy. These are often, um, again, all of our clinics are interdisciplinary. We are almost always have all of our trainees embedded together. Um, and these are really opportunities for clinicians who maybe were not exposed to these type of um, modalities in the past or have a real specialized interest and want more um, opportunities in them. And these are half day clinics um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
where uh, fellows have an opportunity to both learn some didactics um, and also didactics, and also then to uh, both provide therapy that's observed or observe others providing therapy uh, live. So then moving away from our clinics, which tend to be these interdisciplinary um, live psychotherapy opportunities, we have broader teams. We have the anxiety team, we have the depression team, both function pretty similarly. Um, and psychology fellows who are specializing in one of these two areas or who just have an interest are able to then rotate through one of these teams. Um, and basically the way that these teams work is that uh, one day a week, usually Tuesdays, new patient evaluations take place in the morning. And then about every other week, team meetings happen at noon where new patient evaluations are discussed. Maybe um, psychotherapy cases are, are discussed and treatment planning is discussed. We also have a number of, so these are sort of the core experiences that many psycho, um, yeah, psychology trainees will, will go through. But we have a number of more unique offerings that some fellows choose to take advantage of. So we have something called the PREP team, which stands for Program for Risk Evaluation and Prevention of Early Psychosis. Um, and this is really for fellows who might be interested in psychosis or more severe mental illness, and then they could have the opportunity to join PREP. In PREP, an interdisciplinary team of specialists provides evaluations typically for adolescents and young adults, so ages 14 to 30. Um, who may be showing those early prodromal signs of schizophrenia. The evaluation includes comprehensive consultations. The team um, provides referrals for ongoing treatment, either externally or internally to our clinic. And it's really unique. And, and I, I have heard from um, both faculty and fellows who have gone through this clinic that it's, it's a very valuable um, opportunity. External to... Um, Rachel Upjohn Building, we have the Comprehensive Eating Disorders Program, or the CEDP. And this is actually housed at the hospital and offers multiple levels of care. So typically we're looking at outpatient care um, within the Rachel Upjohn Building within this uh, program, but the CEDP offers both a partial hospitalization program and at, at some times it also offers a um, IOP level and they also offer, of course, outpatient care. So fellows may opt to rotate into the CEDP for, um, you know, a rotation six months, three months, something like that, and they can participate there in running PHP groups and carrying an outpatient therapy load. And then finally, we have the perinatal psychiatry clinic, which is also quite um, unique and uh, popular among fellows. So fellows who might be interested in early childhood or perinatal mental health, often in their second year might choose to rotate through the perinatal clinic. Um, similar to some of our other clinics, they have the opportunity to be involved with intakes assessments. Um, and these will be with women who are pregnant or postpartum um, and then with their families as well. And fellows can pick up psychotherapy cases from these intakes. So similar across all of these, you find the opportunity to do intakes, to um, work with an inter interdisciplinary team, and to pick up uh, individual psychotherapy cases on your case alone. So now we'll talk briefly about the research opportunities that are available for this coming recruitment season. So we have um, the opportunity with the Youth Depression and Suicide Prevention Team, with Zero to Thrive Lab, and with the anxiety, OCD, and eating disorders group. Let's talk first about youth depression and suicide program. So one of our most productive research teams here at the University of Michigan in our department is the YDSP. And this year, the YDSP lab is hoping to recruit a fellow with expertise in suicide and depression research. The specific opportunities available this year include things like involvement in an intervention development study for psychiatric hospital, psychiatrically hospitalized youth, there are initiatives focused on studying the effectiveness of systems of care for Black youth at risk for suicide. And then there's other additional opportunities for secondary analyses and manuscript writing um, based on EMA uh, data, studying short-term risk, as well as data stemming from large-scale um, emergency department-based studies. So lots of different opportunities here. And um, from working with many fellows who've gone through this lab and the faculty there. Um, it seems like it's very collaborative and uh, really 
nice opportunity to get your hand into a lot of different projects at the same time. We also have the Zero to Thrive Lab, uh, and this is a program that's focused on perinatal, infant, and early childhood mental health. So the Zero to Thrive Lab, lab offers research and training opportunities really related to supporting early relationships between caregivers and their infants and toddlers. And this is often in the context of par uh, parent mental health challenges or family experience of stress, trauma, or other adversity. Specific, and this is some of the team, um, so specific research opportunities this year may include opportunities to evaluate and support statewide infant mental health initiatives, the evaluation of relational health promotion within integrated perinatal healthcare settings, and um, quality improvement research. This year, we have a new opportunity to join um, uh, my research team, our research team, in examining both child OCD and anxiety disorders um, as well as the eating disorders program. So this research placement will be a collaboration with myself um, and I lead the, I'm the lead psychologist on the child OCD and anxiety disorders program. And then Jessica Van Heist, who leads the comprehensive eating disorders program. Um, she's the lead psychologist. Within this um, collaboration, there are a number, as with any of these other opportunities, a number of research opportunities, including analyzing and writing up neuroimaging and clinical data from recent pediatric OCD and anxiety intervention research, examining augmentations to exposure therapy for youth, using observational study designs to examine eating disorder and treatment, treatment outcomes, and then more collaborative research. So examining, co examining comorbidities across OCD and eating disorders um, and some transdiagnostic treatment research, which is in early stages of development. Um, so if you have a research interest that crosses these areas or is especially in one with a limited interest in the other, we encourage you to apply. Um, and especially if you're interested in new collaborative and transdiagnostic research projects, it might be a really great fit. All right. So those are some of the basics of the program, both the educational opportunities, the clinical opportunities, and the research opportunities. What might a day-to-day -day, um, schedule look like if you are here? So this is probably very small on your screen, but you can see um, what you your first year um, schedule might look like. Uh, if you were in the Zero to Thrive Lab. And don't worry too much about if I move too fast to this. This is all in the brochure, which is on the website, so you can look at it in more depth. And certainly this is just a sample, so every fellow makes their own schedule um, around the different clinics that they are in, involved with. And this might be a second year um, fellow's schedule, but a different lab. All right. So we've talked a lot about what it might be like to be a fellow um, and all the different opportunities and responsibilities, but I also want to take some time to talk about how wonderful it is to be a fellow in Ann Arbor to come here and work with us here. I am, uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor and I went away for a while and I came back because I love it so much. Um, so I have lots of good things to say about Ann Arbor, but I know that there are other people who have lots of good things to say as well. So this is a, uh, a short video. I'm not gonna show it all, just a few moments of it. And if you're interested, you can find the longer version of the video on our website. So just search within our website for life in Ann Arbor. Let's just watch a moment or two of it now. Ann Arbor has just a great vibe about it. A lot of people that come here from afar feel like I'm coming to the Midwest, you know, what does the Midwest really have to offer to compare to like one of your coastal schools? But when they get here, they realize that they get everything they need while still being part of a close-knit, tight community. It kind of takes the best of both coasts in a way. There's this kind of a worldliness within the bubble that is Ann Arbor. It's fun to be here. I would describe Ann Arbor as a very cute okay, town. We can just stop there. Um, if that piques your interest, feel free to watch more of it on the website. Ooh. And here we go. So let's talk just briefly about some of the things that Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan have to offer. Of course, I imagine you might be familiar with football. Um, these are all pictures that are coming up. These are all pictures that I have taken, by the way. And I'm not a big Michigan football fan, but got to do it once in a great while because it's such a community experience and it's appealed 
quite moving to be a part of. Um, but in addition to that sporting event, we have so many other wonderful sporting teams here, if that's your thing. If it's not, our theater is top notch, music is top notch, there's talks and colloquia, I think I already referred to, um, all through the University of Michigan. You can go to um, sort of like University of Michigan events and see their calendar and you'll see like 20 or 30 things just happening today um, that you could as a community member and certainly as a, someone affiliated with the University of Michigan take uh, advantage of. And then outside of the university, outside of work, there are, Ann Arbor is just a wonderful place to be. Um, this is a picture from the Peony Garden, which blooms every June um, and Nichols Arboretum. It's actually, I guess, it's sort of more a University of Michigan thing because the Nichols Arboretum is associated with the university, but uh, the community just goes all out to come and see all of the beautiful um, heirloom peonies. We have parks. We have a beautiful dining and you know downtown uh, experience. So last night I was downtown. And there was, maybe you can even see it in this picture, there's a music venue right down the street. Um, and there were people lined up the whole block just to go to the musical event. Um, there's a comedy club downtown, parks and nature, tons of hiking and walking opportunities. And this is all just within Ann Arbor, really great um, festivals, uh, art, things like that. And of course, just right outside of Ann Arbor are tons of wonderful uh, resources and opportunities. So Detroit is 30 to 45 minutes away, lots of wonderful culture, cultural arts, um, other types of events, festivals, things happening there all the time, great dining as well. Um, within this sort of suburb area, if you think of it that way, there are other small towns nearby, some with more affordable living. So lots of fellows tell me that they like to live in Ypsilanti where it has a more alternative um, lifestyle and vibe that fits a lot of the fellows who, who wanna live there. And um, there are other uh, very close actually to uh, our department. So that's pretty easy for commuting and there's just lots of other opportunities nearby. But then if you expand across Michigan, I say if you come here, you have to visit Northern Michigan because I'm, it's one of my favorite places um, on earth. So you can do the dune climb just outside of um, Glen Arbor. You can go to the Upper Peninsula, visit Pictured Rocks. There's lots of other great things to do in the Upper Peninsula as well. Um, and go for beautiful walks and hikes. Um, and other parts of our upper and lower uh, peninsula. Of course, there's other great things to do too that I am not gonna get into. So go to Traverse City, go to the breweries, um, go visit either of the coasts of Michigan. So the West Coast or the East Coast of Michigan, just some wonderful things to do. I'm clearly uh, partial to any view of water. So if I can be near Lake Michigan, then I'm happy. Now we'll talk a little bit about alumni profiles. So some people who have recently or not so recently graduated from our program and what they had to say about it. So this graduate was a um, postdoc here in 2012 to 2013. Um, and she said that her most rewarding research experience was exploring the importance of enhancing adaptive grief and parentally bereaved children via discussions about death. Her favorite clinical rotation was the Infant and Early Childhood Clinic with Dr. Kate Rosenblum, which, you know, as I said, is a, one of um, very commonly expressed to be a very unique and rewarding uh, training experience. Um, people talked about, or and she talked about uh, spending time with her fellow postdoctoral fellows. Another fellow here talks about how her most rewarding experience was being awarded the STAR Award um, from the Depression Center and having the opportunity to conduct her own follow-up study. Um, so there are a number of both institutional and departmental uh, funding awards and opportunities offered usually once or twice a year. And lots of fellows apply for and get their own funding there to really set them up themselves up for writing a K award or other types of grant funding opportunities down the road. Lots of um, 
postdoctoral fellows do choose to write a K award during their fellowship, um, and others focus more on grant funding within the department, and some choose, you know, a more clinically oriented um, fellowship. Another um, now faculty member at Baylor said of her time here that being awarded the, her most research uh, re, her most rewarding research experience was being awarded the NIMH Diversity is the Coleman Award and she was able to engage in research specific to barriers to care among Black college students who were at, eleva at elevated risk for suicide and then her favorite clinical rotation was TAG and she talks about um, enjoying exploring Ann Arbor and Detroit. UMich University of Michigan football game and traveling to Detroit. Again, it's very close, very easy to get to. I didn't mention it's also quite um, easy to get to Chicago for our train ride or drive. Um, lots of people like to take advantage of that as well. Um, Dr. Arango is now a faculty member in our department and uh, her time here, she talked about um, the benefits of the strong clinical and research training, um, the YDSP, lab and being incredibly collaborative, talented and supportive. Um, and her favorite clinical rotation was working on the inpatient unit, which we sometimes have opportunities for fellows to do a rotation on our inpatient unit for child and adolescent. And that she enjoyed and enjoys exploring the trails nearby, camping in the UP. Dr. Riggs is also a current faculty member in our department. And she's talked about the fellowship being unique, off, uh, obtaining specialized training with populations that she cares deeply about, and the flexibility of the program as being things that she would, uh, you know, advertise to other fellows. IECC came up again as a favorite clinical rotation, and she talks about the beauty of the nature, um, both locally and uh, up north, I think, as well. And then Dr. Meyer, she recently graduated from our program this August, and she is now um, a faculty member at Indiana University. She talked about this program being her dream job with specialized clinical training and research opportunities. Um, I included her because she listed me as one of her favorite clinical rotations um, and enjoying, oh here, she mentions that enjoying that Chicago is four hours away, um, but also all of the things that you know, the nature that Ann Arbor has to offer and access to Detroit and things like that. So hopefully that's a, a sampling of what different fellows over the past 10 years or so have found to be helpful. So let's talk some nitty gritty about how to apply. So the deadline for applications this year is Wednesday, December 1st. And interviews typically take place in January. Interviews will all be virtual this year and we will review applications. Um, I'm hoping in December and contact people for interviews as soon, soon after. We are gonna abide by the common hold date, which is February 27th, 2023. And if you're not familiar with that, essentially um, what that will mean is that fellows, applicants um, will be able to, uh, programs will be able to offer um, a position or, um, you know, offer a candidacy, a postdoctoral um, position to their top candidate. Um, and then that fellow can hold on to the offer until they make a decision or until February 27th, um, whichever comes first. So at, by February 27th, all top choices will have to make their decision and other um, offers can be extended after that time. And it's possible that those offers will be extended earlier. So if um, we offer to one applicant and they decide to go with a different offer, then we can offer it to our next candidate, things like that. Okay, what do we require for application? So we want a CV, three letters of recommendation, and this includes one from your graduate programs, DCT, attesting to your readiness for graduation, one from a primary clinical supervisor, and one from someone who can just talk about your preparation for advanced training in clinical child psychology. We also ask for a graduate school transcript, unofficial is acceptable at that, at that point when you're applying. And then we want you to provide a detailed cover letter describing your background in clinical psychology, your training goals for postdoc, your future career objectives, 
your clinical and research training experiences and your commitment experiences with diverse populations. I know I said that all very quickly, all of those details of what we're looking for in a cover letter are available on our website. And to that point, applications may be submitted directly to our website. Um, and this is what our landing page looks like. If you were to scroll down on the screenshot, which I obviously can't do, um, it would have an apply here or apply now button. And you just click on that and you can submit all of your um, materials to us directly. So in a moment, we will uh, end the recording and then open it up for questions. But if you have a question and you are not attending live or you don't have an opportunity to ask it live tonight, feel free to email me any questions. I'd be really happy to um, answer them via email or set up a time to talk. So this is my email address here. And then we'll go ahead and end the recording. <laughs>